with Dr. Jenkins. Nice to see you. Welcome back. Yeah, thank you. Second wave, second lockdown. Yeah. Here we are again. <laughs> and you did a really interesting post on your Facebook the other day. Uh, I wondered if we could kind of dissect it because you made really interesting points of kind of where we are okay, at the yeah. moment. And I'll fire them at you. Go for it. Yeah, just go for it. I'm more than happy. One yeah. of the things you talked about was the fact that respiratory viruses like winter. So that's kind of another idea of why we're getting this second wave. So why is that? Why do viruses typically like the winter? Yeah, and it was predicted. I guess like first time round, it was a new virus. It was going to go into people for a bit. And then obviously we had a lockdowns and it seemed to go into abeyance. Um, it was still around to an extent. And um, we are now seeing this acceleration again in the winter period. Um, and obviously, if you look at other viruses, so flu, the common cold, um, there's this virus called RSV, which causes bronchiolitis in children. They're, they are around in winter, they're seasonal. Um, so I think there's several factors. One is that um, they seem to thrive more in cold conditions. Um, so they actually um, live longer in colder conditions. And the other thing is that um, as individuals, we're more susceptible in the winter. Uh, for reasons that you know, I'm not sure we understand fully, but something to do with the season, the sunlight, the vitamin D, um, all those factors that make us as individuals more susceptible. Obviously, the thing is that we're stuck indoors more. So mm. it's you know, in the summer you can be outdoors, um, uh, whereas being indoors um, means that the uh, uh, the spread is going to be that much more. And you, you just need to look at the um, the meat packing plants where outbreaks were incredibly. Uh, rapid in meatpacking plants and the assumption there is that um, it's the it's the enclosed conditions it's the fact they're extremely cold and that people have to shout a lot to make themselves heard and and uh, uh, it's very noticeable um, so maybe that's a sort of a um, like a uh, uh, reproducing the effects of winter in effect so mm. in that sense what's happening now this winter was predictable. You said as well about transmission and how it spread aerosol spread particularly in these closed conditions is perhaps more of a factor than we thought initially. Yeah, so um, obviously the reason that we um, observe the two metre rule is because of droplet spread. So we think about coughs and sneezes mm. spread diseases. So most respiratory infections we assumed are due to coughing and sneezing, producing a droplet that flies out of your uh, mm. mouth and nose and then will drop to the ground over a short distance. Um, whereas with aerosol generation, you've got more smaller droplets that will mm -hmm. stay in the air for long. And um, obviously nobody knows for sure, but there is more and more evidence that aerosol spread that might occur through, for instance, talking, singing, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, may well be a factor in COVID and potentially other respiratory viruses as well. Um, there's a lot of research going on. It's quite difficult to understand. But if you, I don't know if you've ever seen any of the studies where they've looked at particles visually. And it's very dramatic to see how many particles emerge from just people talking mm. um, and how well they are stopped by masks. Um, the other thing that obviously we think about is uh, spread by surfaces. Um, so obviously that's why we wash hands and clean surfaces. And there's no doubt that that is an important method of spread, but it, I think there is some evidence to suggest that we've perhaps overplayed the role mm. of surfaces and underplayed the role of aerosol. And I think the aerosol means that once you're indoors with people in an enclosed space for a, a period of time, the likelihood of transmission goes right up. Mm -hmm. Particularly poorly ventilated spaces exactly. or, yeah. or spending yeah. long amounts of time in the same space. I know you, you, you shared on your Facebook as well, like a really interesting graphic of um, I'll share that in the link down below of different spreads and estimation of um, I didn't really realize I didn't I mean it makes sense but actually the amount of time you spend with someone in an area like in a classroom and things mm. like that also is a contributing factor. It, it, it does seem to make a huge difference and one of the Korean studies they said talking for more than half an hour um, right. um, was, a, was a strong risk factor. Immunity as well this is an interesting thing is that this seems to be a huge focus at the moment particularly with uh, the vaccine but we'll talk about that later. You know, we, we are very excited getting antibody tests here but it's difficult to interpret them when we don't know how long that immunity lasts or um, how much having antibodies actually give you a certain amount of immunity. Mm. So how, how, and in terms of reinfection as well, where, where are we with thinking about that? So at the moment, um, the assumption I would make, looking at it simply, is that it's a new virus, therefore no one has ever had immunity to this virus before, so it's emerged. So. 
um, we're initially you're relying on um, uh, what's called a NATE immunity, which is your basic defences. Children have got lots of that. That's why children are better protected. The elderly have got less of it. Mm. So that's why it's affected older people more. Um, for those people that get infected, they produce an immune response um, that's based on um, antibody production through B cells, plus this other part of the immune system called T cells. Um, and as far as we can see, um, that immunity is measurable with an antibody test and persists for a period of time. Um, the worry is that it, there is some evidence that in some people it's dropping off. Mm. Um, and the worry, of course, with that is that you're not going to be able to achieve this kind of herd immunity through infection. Um, and we've already seen a small number of cases of reinfection with COVID, which is obviously quite a scary thought. Mm. The idea that you would have it once and, and have to potentially have it again. At the moment, the numbers are small, but as time goes on, we do need to be aware of the fact that it could be something you could get again. Um, so and that is that, a worry. And how does, I mean, because I just assume from my basic immunology mm. that once you had a virus, you yeah, didn't really get, yeah. you had some immunity for quite a while. Yeah, so, it, so did I. And, and so I always thought is, it was about a mutation that meant yeah, you didn't then get it again. Yeah. But. Um, I suspect we don't really know, do we? Mm. And I think if you think about it, it's a, a, a form of coronavirus. There are four other major coronaviruses that mm. cause common colds, um, plus all these other cold viruses and stuff. And it, we assume that, as they say, that you get reinfected by a different strain, mm. but I guess we just don't know. Um, mm. It is certainly true that with other coronaviruses, um, the ones that cause colds, the immunity will tend to wane off after a year or so. So you could potentially be affected by those again. But obviously when you come to vaccination, Mm -hmm. um, then uh, the idea of obviously vaccination is to try and uh, obviously train yourself to have a, an antibody response that's effective. Um, and we'd hope that you could achieve long lasting immunity with vaccination, but we simply don't know at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, the current vaccine studies look very, very hopeful, I would say, um, much perhaps better than I would have expected. Um, and, you know, I think on a more positive note, they offer a route out of this problem essentially um, so if if the uh, you know the early studies um, are translated into um, uh, bigger studies then you know I think th there is the prospect of using vaccination to achieve immunity it might need to be topped up from time to time but it means that you could try to protect um, uh, the majority of the population the majority of the time um, mm. one of the things I posted I was worried that if you had a vaccine that was only let's say 70 percent effective and you only were able to cover, because not everyone's going to have it, I'm sure, um, you were only able to cover, let's say, 70 or 80 percent of the population, you might be below that 60 percent herd immunity threshold level that would protect the population. Um, but with the current vaccines looking at a higher level of effectiveness at 90 percent, I think that's very positive, and I suspect that governments are very pleased to see that result. And of course, that's what is needed to um, move towards getting the economies up and running again. Mm -hmm. I mean, because I think we talked about what we learned from the first wave in terms of treatment, but that's not going to have a huge impact on numbers. The treatment is still very much primitive. It's pretty primitive, mm. yeah. I mean, it's pretty basic stuff, isn't it? I mean, it's using very old medications. And I certainly have heard people say that, um, you know, it's not such a big killer and that modern treatments are doing amazing things. I mean. My experience now with looking after patients in the second wave is that we have one treatment, dexamethasone, which is a steroid, which is a drug that's been around for, you know, 50 odd years, um, um, which is effective and seems to be slowing, modifying the illness um, and making a difference to survival. Um, uh, a modest but significant difference, but all the other sort of uh, more fancy new drugs that have been in trial development thus far have disappointed. Mm -hmm. um, so we haven't got any yet major blockbuster therapies that are sort of real cures for COVID. I mean, there's still some um, trials to report, um, but thus far I've been disappointed um, mm. with some of the things that we're seeing. Certainly not as promising as the the kind of cutting edge vaccine stuff we're hearing. Yeah, which is, that's right. And, and it just shows the, the unpredictability of medicine, you know. Mm. One might have expected it to be the other way around, but it yeah, just, right. just, just goes to show. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, I've noticed that obviously we're still doing a lot of the supportive care of, you know, oxygen and fluids and ventilation, mm. but we're really just buying time for 
the immune system, the person to fight the virus themselves, isn't it? Which is often the case of viruses in general, isn't it? In and, and any infection, in effect. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. We're um, uh, <laughs> supporting people through their own recovery. I mean, the big thing as well is the healthcare system, the NHS. Every winter <laughs> when I'm in hospital, I always think, blimey, this is really tough. Every single, and I always forget, it's sort of, by the time it, it's really getting on top of me, we're into the spring, into the summer, and then, and then the winter comes around again. Given this extra load on mm. the NHS, what, what are your thoughts on how we're going to tackle that? Well, I feel a bit bad because last winter was a quiet one. And I remember about February <laughs> time I said, oh, it's been not a proper winter this year. Mm -hmm. um, what's happened? And then obviously COVID happened. So mm -hmm. probably it's all my fault. Mm -hmm. But essentially now it's the last, the first wave of COVID occurred at a time when health demand is generally low in the sort of spring, early yeah. summer. There was a lockdown. People avoided hospital. Lots of medical encounters that should have happened were put off. So in other words, the hospitals coped with a very complex and difficult situation actually pretty well. Um, now we've got the winter and all the other effects of the respiratory viruses, and certainly in the UK, we've got a big backlog of elective surgical work to be done, plus this big chunk of COVID work coming in. So it's three things at once. Um, so it is going to put a huge strain on hospitals. And for those people wondering why the current lockdown is happening, that's the reason, mm. is that out of control, this COVID one would have just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, this acute respiratory winter work isn't going to go away, although it may be slightly reduced by social distancing and masking. So the thing that would have suffered would have been um, uh, cancer surgery and surgery in general. And um, I know an argument has been put forward is that you know, um, lockdown is harming this, but actually that's not the case. The reverse is true, actually. If we'd let COVID go out of control, we wouldn't have, we'd, our ability to treat the rest of it would have been compromised. That's a really interesting point. I've seen a lot of mm. people post that, that mm. we've got, you know, uh, waiting times for this, it's impacting on these services. Mm. Mm. But what you've got to remember is that that cohort of people who are waiting for those are more at risk of getting COVID and having adverse complications yeah, if yeah. they've got these comorbidities. Yeah. Um, also, as you say, the COVID is very much a com you get compound interest on this R number, don't you? So mm. if you let it get out of control, it really goes out of it, control. It would, it would, yeah. I mean, it would have been like a bit of a zombie apocalypse situation in the sense that no one would have wanted to come to hospital. Our hospitals mm. would have been completely full. No one's going to want to come in and have a cancer operation if, if, if it's everywhere and if it's totally out of control. So I think that's the bit that hasn't been factored in. Having said that, you know, there's no doubt that lockdown and all the stuff that went out had lots and lots of adverse consequences, which you've got to be aware of, you know, mental health effects and all the rest of it. And I think, um, you know, it's not a zero sum game. Mm. Um, I'd say it was the marginally the least worst of two right. bad options. Um, but obviously, you know, it's important that we learn from it. And, you know, I think we probably already learned a lot from the first time around. We're now trying to run... Um, you know, like you've had your red and green zone in ED mm -hmm. and effectively you're trying to run red and green zones um, and also what's described as amber zones within hospitals to try and separate the two and keep the two things going along all at once. So I think that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the north of England, for instance, where it's been much busier already, already the elective surgical work has had to be sacrificed a number of areas. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of where it would go. And imagine in other countries in Europe and in the US, the same thing is happening. Talking about these difficult calls you have to make, how do you feel the government has handled this um, overall? Well, I think uh, the more you think about it, you do have to have sympathy for those in power in what is a very difficult situation. And as doctors, uh, we can sympathise with that in terms of being judged on a position that often people don't understand. Yeah. You're forced to make difficult decisions. Yeah. Yeah. And you've, sometimes you've just got to make a call. Mm. Um, uh, I wouldn't give the UK government a very high mark. Um, and, you know, it's been well documented where the problems have, have mm. arisen um, and uh, with test and trace failures being at the top of it. Mm. Um, but I do think we have to be aware of the fact that it would have been difficult whatever was done. And, you know, um, uh, across Europe, the same phenomenon is happening everywhere, even in countries that have got different approaches. Yeah. So I think that's an important thing to be aware of. Mm. What well, I've always found surprising, I did this when I looked at the, the Bill Gates video on the channel was that this was entirely predictable. Uh, although we, you, you don't know exactly what's going to happen, I did feel like we lacked any kind of real clear direction at times. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know it's a, 
it's, it's very difficult for them, but I feel like it wasn't a priority and it wasn't the, the groundwork wasn't really done no, in terms uh, of a response. No, and the pandemic plan wasn't there for sure. And you know, I'm sure you heard the stories about the PPE, which is up in a warehouse in in, in Liverpool. So the the pre it wasn't there. And I, I guess all we can really say is that we all need to learn for you know because this may well not be the only pandemic that we get in the next five or ten years. Let's end on a positive mm. with the vaccine results mm. that have come in. I think that was a, a huge surprise. And yeah, I mean, it was it was definitely good. And I, I'm sure, you know, governments, um, you know, uh, businesses signed a bit of a sigh of relief. I guess we've got to put a note of caution in that there's a lot mm. of work to be done. Sure. And um, you know what we need to look at is what what does the future look like? You know how how soon could you roll out a vaccine? Will people take it? Can we show it's effective? Can we show it's safe? How will it then impact on our day to day life? How do you protect the vulnerable? Mm. Is the vaccine going to stop transmission? Um, you know when are we going to mm. stop wearing masks? Um, I mean the thing that always strikes me is you know you and I both like music you know the idea of a basement bar you know that i feel so sorry for people in that situation when are you going to be able to reopen a basement bar where you've got you know a tiny space very enclosed with people you know when can that sort of thing get back and going so i think when that sort of thing can get back mm -hmm. again is when we know that things are back to normal how long is that going to take i've no idea but it's going to be a while i mean i think there's a, a prospect that next year things will start to look more normal mm -hmm. Look forward to that time. Mm. Dr Jenkins, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure, pleasure. Thank you.